Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Untold Story podcast. I am really thrilled to have with me Kaylee McEnany today, who is the author of the new book, Serenity in the Storm. And uh, it's just great to, I love taking these opportunities, Kaylee, to get a chance to talk to people who are part of our Fox News family and uh, and get help people get to kind of let them know them a little bit better. So, hi. Hi, it's an honor to be here with you. Oh, it's great to have you. So, you know, one of the things that really strikes me when I think about you, and I always watch you on Outnumbered and um, appearing on all of our other shows, you just, you have an incredible academic resume. I I mean, I don't know that people know your um, educational history, but you went to Harvard, Harvard Law School, uh, JD, Georgetown University School of Foreign Services, and also studied politics and international relations at Oxford University's St. Edmunds Hall. Were you you always just like super smart as a kid growing up? I loved politics from a young age. I mean, age of eight, I don't come from a political family. It it just was kind of in my blood. Loved studying, loved books, loved debate for a little bit of time. Like tried to become a cheerleader and like do the the popular thing and talked my way onto the team because I loved the art of debate. (laughs) Um, But no, I was always academically motivated. My mom taught me just to have a love of learning, Mm -hmm. to try to be the best in school. And I always did that. And I will say, you know, my one year I spent studying at Oxford was the most, um, I would say, formative experience you know people I went to the podium in the White House and people say you know what trained you for that and it's really that year at Oxford it's um, unlike the American education system where you write a paper you get a red marking maybe a note here or there Oxford you have to read it out loud before a very well studied academic Um, and they grill you they ask your footnotes they ask your sourcing and you have to be able to stand up for yourself and stand up for what you've written I remember my first tutorial was grueling I left in tears because I had been just annihilated but in the most positive of ways it made me better made me stronger and so yes I've always loved to learn yeah I mean it's really impressive and um, when you're talking about that experience it strikes me how soft so much of our education has become. I mean, we're not supposed to do things where kids leave in tears because they feel like they didn't measure up. So why was that, why do you think that is valuable? And do you think we're too soft now in in the way that we are training kids academically? Without a doubt. Um, Now kids have to be coddled. Um, They oftentimes have to speak a certain point of view and any alternate view is unacceptable. When academia, what, what makes academia great traditionally and historically is having countering views points. You know, my first tutorial, my tutor thought very different than me. She was a former member of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. I was this Republican, Western-minded, Israel-loving individual. I still am to this day. But she questioned me. She made me better. She sharpened me. And though we left with very different viewpoints, you know, she wrote me a recommendation and said, you are in the top 3% of students I ever taught. And she did that because I was open-minded to her her point of view. She challenged my points of view. And isn't it refreshing that, you know, an Israel-loving Republican could sit across from a former member of the PLO and be enriched and and be better for having differing viewpoints. It's a great story because that's exactly what academic uh, history should be. And I think it is still more like that in the UK. Do you think it's more like that there than here? Yes, for sure. Um, You know, Cambridge is very much similar to Oxford. And these two systems, really, it's every child's dream in England to go to one of these two. And they uphold those virtues, you know, so much so, um, you know, at Oxford, they, they have a they're known for bringing in people from all sorts of different walks of life and speaking to their student body. Um, and they prize that. They prize that. I hope they never change. Yeah. And I hope we can get some of that DNA back into our education system. You're a mom of two young children. Yep. So when you think about how you're going to handle their education, what do you what do you think about? What's your approach going to be, and how, how old are they? Tell everybody about about that first. Yes, so I have a three year old and I have a five month old, and that question you ask, I think, is the hardest question to answer because, unfortunately, in today's society, you have to make certain calculations because um, there's so much at play when you think about education. There's the violence we've seen in our schools. There's the curriculum that is a concern. You know, we've seen critical race theory, critical gender theory, the removal of parents um, from the decision making in their child's life, and you know. For me, I was raised in all-girls Catholic school. I loved it. My husband went to all-boys Catholic school. He loved it. Um, though I am Southern Baptist, I, I love 
Catholic education. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like it. Um, so my, my children, they'll go to Catholic school. Um, they'll leave believing in a God and a creator, and it'll hopefully shield them from some of the maladies that they will inevitably face in this really toxic culture we're in. Yeah. Um, I, I grew, I'm Catholic, um, but I didn't go to Catholic school. I went to public high schools and private universities. And um, then I ended up sending, we ended up sending our kids to Catholic middle schools and high schools and then universities. And um, I, I do think that because there's so much sort of, um, you know, because life is so sectarian, to have that in your school environment, to have faith in your school environment, at least gives them that sort of grounding in it. Uh, and they're surrounded by people who, you know, and, and not everyone who goes to Catholic school is Catholic, obviously. Um, there are many different backgrounds, but I, I think for, for them, it, I think it was the best education that they could get. Yeah, for sure. You know, when you look at data that suggests, um, I think this was in the Wall Street Journal, 81% of parents said that their child ages 8 to 13 were on social media. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really toxic environment. You know, we've talked about the curated images that Senator Blumenthal found of eating disorders when he created a, a faux profile of a young girl. You know, these are things that unfortunately are going to hit our children in the face. So when they have good parents who we pray before Blake goes to bed, we we read her a Jesus Calling devotional. Um, I pray before we send her off to school. It's ingratiated within her. She mm -hmm. knows she can say, Jesus is in my heart. When you say, where's Jesus? She says, in my heart. You hope that that foundation will carry them through the really treacherous waters of life. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think it's one of, you, you, in your book, you talk a lot about sort of the coming apart at the seams, and we were talking about this earlier, that I think a lot of people feel in American life today. You know, we all talk to people who say, what's going on? How did the world get so crazy? And now the latest conversation that I think is so unsettling to people is all of this artificial intelligence and how it's going to take over um, everything, you know, the, the, the threat that it could take over civilization, which you hear coming from smart people. It sounds like something crazy that you hear in some futuristic film, but they're serious about the concerns that they have about all of this. So, you know, you went through a lot in your time at the White House. You worked on COVID. You worked on, and, and that, you know, was a period where I think we started to feel this fraying mm -hmm. of our society. So tell me a little bit about how you approached this book. You know, I approached it in a way that I wanted it to be bigger than a president or a political party, because I do believe what we're facing is bigger than that. We're at a moment where we're leaving behind, you know, I've talked a lot about faith, but also family and tradition and patriotism and things that united us. So I really wanted to expose some of the cultural rot but at the same time show optimism that God is at work even now, you know, in our education system, the fact that school choice was upheld. If you wanted to go to a religious school in the state of Maine with your subsidy, you can now do that. You know, Coach Kennedy can kneel in silent prayer at the 50 yard line, silent prayer. Um, you know, these sorts of things, the Dobbs decision, in my view, um, upholding life. So God is at work even now, but we've got to get back to the shared understanding of patriotism, of cherishing our American flag, of, of God. And if faith isn't your answer, patriotism and family are certainly a part of the equation. You know, so what do you say to people who, you know, hear all of this discussion and they say, you know, oh, that it's intolerant, it's sort of, you know, a white view of, of the country. Um, they think about all of these groups that are marginalized, that they feel aren't included in this kind of vision. What would you say to that? Look at the fruits of the Christian community and the faith community broadly. Um, I write about this a little. Um, and in the wake of Sandy Hook, which was a tragedy, probably one of the biggest national tragedies we've had when you think about the loss of those young little ones, there was a piece written in the New York Times, um, the author's name evades me, but it was basically about the sectarian response during times of suffering and the Christian response. And he noted that at this time of deep suffering for our country, you know, President Obama referenced God and his faith, and it almost sounded like a sermon. Um, all of the young children had services in their various faith communities, every single one of them in the Christian community outpoured in their response, not just to that tragedy, but national tragedies in this country and around the world. And when you see the fruits of what happens um, when you embrace Jesus Christ, the fruits tell the story. It's loving, it's tolerant. Um, and any intolerance you hear, I would say, is not in, uh, a byproduct of faith. Perhaps it's a misunderstanding of it. Hmm. You know, um, 
it feels like, you know, it's interesting when you talk about even President Obama, you know, evoking faith in that moment, it feels like we so quickly got away from that in public discourse. You know, it wasn't long ago when those kind of references were sort of typical of what you would hear. And I, you know, I think that, um, how, how did we get so far away from that so quickly? Yeah, you know, I think there's been some unhelpful, divisive political rhetoric from both parties. Um, we've lost sight of viewing each other through the lens of human beings. Mm -hmm. And it's why I wish we could take the political discourse and bring it down a notch. We've heard it from Biden. Who's going to do that, though? I mean, where does that start? You know, Tim Scott, I, look, I, he has a long path to the nomination, but I will tell you his message of optimism harkens back to a time where Obama talked about faith. Bush talked about faith. There was something that took us above the political fray. And of course, I'm not Pollyanna here. You're going to have political jousting. Of course, you've always had that. Um, but we've got to have a message that takes us a, a step above the uh, mano a mano fighting we're in. Tim Scott, I love his message, um, though he's got a, a long path to the nomination based on polling. Yeah, indeed. Um, you know, when you talk about three phone calls that sort of changed your life, Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, I've had, it just occurred to me one day as I was writing a speech, um, I was going to talk to a group of young women. It occurred to me that I'd had three really important phone calls. One um, was in 2009. It was in December. I found out I had the BRCA gene, which put me at an 84% chance of breast cancer. My mom uh, was a carrier of this gene as well. It was a, a not so happy call, lots of tears after that one, though I've since taken control um, and, and chose to have a double mastectomy and it was a good decision. Um, and then there was another call I got that was from President Trump asking me to be his press secretary in March of 2020. A jubilant call, an exciting call, a, a career-changing call. And then there was a call I got about 10 blocks from here. I was living in an apartment, working here at Fox News as a producer. I was going through a very lonely time. I left work. I went home, tried to call family. They weren't answering. Um, I said, God, if you're out there, I just need to hear from you. And in that moment, my phone lit up, and it was a number I didn't know. And I was like, if it's a telemarketer, I don't care. I'll talk to them. <laughs> and um, it was, in fact, a member of my church. And I don't even remember if this was a man or a woman, but the member of the church said, we feel like we need to pray for you. How can we pray for you? And that call changed my life because I felt it was a moment of God talking through one of his emissaries here on earth directly to me. Um, and if you're lonely or upset or hurting, I challenge you to issue the same challenge to God, and you'd be amazed at, at how he'll respond. You know, what would you say to people who maybe aren't familiar with you or your faith about why you would want them to pick up this book? I would say, you know, I think it will give you an answer to a lot of the troubles you face in life. You know, God doesn't promise us a perfect life. I, I talk in here a little bit about Uvalde, um, deeply affected me um, as a mother, of course, Nashville too. That was after the time that I wrote this. God doesn't promise us a perfect life, free of pain, free of suffering. Um, but what he does promise is something so much bigger than this. I love the series, The Chosen. And at one point, Jesus gets this whimsical look on his face and he says, it's funny that you ask about time and you just see this glimmer in his eye, like our pain here on earth in the big scheme of eternity, it's so small. And one day I think we'll look back at how God never intended for us to have pain um, after the downfall of man, but he used our pain for the betterment of his kingdom. So if you're hurting, um, just know eternity is a lot bigger than this really blip in time. Yeah, it's interesting. We were talking about that series because we both really appreciate it. Um, I think it's a really interesting window into the people that Christ chose to follow him, his apostles. And it really makes it humanizes them. It, it, you know, they're they're real people who experienced this extraordinary, probably the most extraordinary experience. I can't think of anything um, more so. But one of the things that struck me in that as well that sticks with me is um, when people go through hard times, the understanding that you don't see all of the times that you were you just missed something terrible yeah. or you were saved by something that you don't realize or, you know, that car moved out of your path. And all of the times that um, believers believe that, you know, that, that God has stepped in for them, because sometimes I think people only notice, you know, how could this happen? How could this terrible thing happen? And don't see all of the other moments of grace. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, we don't see all the answered prayers, but mm -hmm. when you just take a moment and look at, at nature and the things that God has created. Um, if you change your lens, you see God working all of the time in incredible ways. Um, but you're exactly right. Unless we get that answered prayer we so desperately hope for, sometimes it seems like he's silent and he's distant. All right, so before I let you go, just switching gears, 
Um, we talk a lot about politics. You obviously have a career uh, as a press secretary at the White House. Okay, so let's get your thoughts quickly on 2024. You mentioned Tim Scott. Um, some people think at this point this is going to be a very brief primary period um, and that the former president who you worked for is leading the way right now. What do you see in, in the future here? He is leading the way um, and his polling gap has been growing and growing and growing. But, you know, I would caution it's early. And if you look back in various cycles, there were always people who, who surged to the top that the story didn't quite work out the way um, one thought. Ben Carson, for instance, was at the top of the polls at, right. at one point in 2016. So Ron DeSantis hasn't even declared. Um, he will declare. He will get a tailwind behind him. And then at that point, it crystallizes around debates and big moments that can reshape mm -hmm polling. I don't think it's baked in at this point. I think at certainly now it looks like President Trump will be the nominee. But I would just put a note of caution. I think there's an appetite in the Republican Party for competition, for a thoughtful debate. And a Do you debate think President Trump, the former president, will participate in those because he's kind of suggesting that he doesn't know if he needs to? I do think he'll participate because I think he will see the gap close. I mean, it's, sometimes we have to back up and say, at this point, someone's not even in the race, it's number two, and that'd be Governor DeSantis. I do think it will close. I think he'll debate. I've never seen President Trump hide from a fight, and I would also caution him. If he wants to skip a debate, beware. Your opponent, Joe Biden, will use the same logic and say, well, you didn't debate, so why do I need to debate you in the general election? So you're opening yourself up for, I think it's a short-sighted strategy, should he not debate. It's going to be fascinating. Kaylee, thank you very much for giving everybody a little glimpse into your untold story. And uh, congratulations on your book. You're already a New York Times bestselling author. And this book is called Serenity in the Storm. And boy, does it feel like we're in a storm right now, folks. So um, we're all looking for a little serenity in it. So thank you so much for being with us today, Kaylee. Thank Great you, Great to talk to you. Thanks.